Well, thank you very much for the invitation, Tenemis. Uh, happy birthday, happy 70th birthday. I must say you don't look any a day over 40. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. And the, the purpose of these talks is to provide you an idea of some of the research that's going on and is funded by ten of us. So we're the ones who spend your money. And as Alan's already pointed out, I just wanted to make, reiterate the point that, yes, we, we spend the money on research and hopefully are pushing forward uh, potential new therapeutics for cancer in a variety of fields. But I think just as importantly, that money goes towards training uh, the next generation of scientists uh, in these PhD programs. And I think Luke and Mira uh, and the others who will be talking today are fine examples of that. And uh, if we can do more to get these uh, students enthused in cancer research and push them into, into this field, the better, I think. OK, Alan's done a fantastic job at introducing the problems that we have uh, in terms of getting new drugs to the clinic. So thanks to him, I don't need to labor that point. So I'm going to focus a little bit more on the actual research that's going on in my lab uh, and a very specific question to do with breast cancer that we think is very important. And that is uh, the issue of metastatic breast cancer, which I will uh, introduce to you now. So there are about 45,000 patients, I'm talking about the UK here, 45,000 page, uh, patients will present to the clinic each year and will be diagnosed with breast cancer. And unfortunately, around about a quarter of those, about 12,000 women, will d die of the disease uh, annually. So this is a very important uh, problem. And it's clear that the vast majority of those patient deaths is due to a process called uh, metastasis. Now, what is metastasis? Well, basically, when a, when a patient presents to the clinic with a, with a tumor or a lump in their breast, um, it, there's every chance that those patients can get treated uh, relatively quickly. And if we look at the statistics on the bottom of this slide here, the patient presents very, uh, with a very early stage disease. They stand a very good chance of uh, successful treatment. But if that patient uh, either presents with a very aggressive form early on, or uh, during treatment the disease progresses to a later stage or aggressive form, then the chances of survival do drop. They still have a, a good chance, but the, you can see by the statistics there that um, there is a much reduced, um, uh, much higher risk uh, of them not surviving um, the uh, treatment. So this is a very, we see this obviously as a very important clinical unmet clinical need, both for uh, clinicians and for basic scientists to try and address this problem. So what is it, what is this metastasis that I'm talking about? Well, the two slides there, the two images there show the progression of the disease from a lump in the breast to the manifestation or the movement of that uh, part of that tumor to other parts of the body. And if those, uh, if the tumor migrates and, and seeds uh, vital organs in the body, this is when the um, tumor becomes aggressive and pernicious. So there's a simple uh, solution to that, which of course is much more difficult to actually address. Can we actually stop that process from happening? So you can imagine a patient coming to the clinic with an early stage disease, we could give them fantastic drug X, and that drug would then stop the progression of the disease while we think about how to successfully treat those patients. And we've heard about the successes of tamoxifen and other drugs in the breast cancer field, which are extremely effective at uh, eliminating disease, including surgery as well, of course. So if we could stop the progress, then we might be able to do something and, and improve the prognosis of a lot more patients. So what we need to do then is understand what this metastasis is all about, this, this movement of the cells within a tumor to other parts of the body. And there are two important characteristics of that process. One is that if we just, if you see the little panels just inside those two images there, the pink areas, those are cross sections through two types of tumor. One very, on the left hand side, one very early stage tumor, on the right hand side, a much more aggressive tumor. Simply by looking at those cells, we can see that they are profoundly different. And a lot of work over the last 20 or 30 years has demonstrated that there's some fundamental differences between those two, the cells within those tumors. 
One being the fact that the cells on the right in the advanced stage um, move a lot. They're able to move around uh, through tissues and amongst tissues, and that property of being able to move is exactly the property that results in them ending up in other parts of the body. So one way that we could tackle the disease is to stop those cells from moving. Then there's a second point, which Alan has ex uh, really nicely explained to us, and that's the idea that uh, you can look at pretty much any solid tumor uh, in a patient. This is a cross-section through a standard tumor of breast cancer that you would find, excuse me, find from a patient. And you see that none of the cells are very, very different looking. It's not a uniform uh, picture of a very homogeneous picture of uh, very similar cells. There's a whole variety of different cells in there. And that tells us that those cells are going to have very different characteristics. That some are then going to respond to therapy, some are going to be very resistant, some are going to have that, m that migration, that motile activity, the ones that can move around, others aren't. And it's now <clears throat> clear, based on this idea that Alan has um, proposed to us, this cancer stem cell hypothesis, that there's only a very small population of cells within the tumor that are able to have this motile property but also able to seed to the rest of the body. It may be only 1% of a, a given tumor has this property to seed elsewhere in the body. So we have another um, I, um, uh, approach, and that is to kill, specifically try and target those very pernicious cells and actually eliminate those using toxics, uh, toxins, drugs that will go in and selectively target those cells. And that cartoon really just displays this idea of cancer stem cell mediated therapy. That's the idea of just going in and trying to kill off the cancer stem cells, these few pernicious cells within the tumor. Okay, so just a little bit of emphasis on, on what we do in the lab, and then I'm going to introduce you to our ice skating star. So um, historically, the lab has worked on uh, the fundamental um, biology of how the mammary gland or how the breast works and to basically if we can understand what's under the bonnet of the car then if things go wrong then we might be able to understand what's gone wrong and then fix it. So we've used the mouse mammary gland as a model of human breast <coughs> and human breast cancer because it looks very very similar. Um, there are two main projects in the lab that have come out from those mouse studies. We've identified two genes which we think are very important in this whole metastatic process. And they're actually targeting the two very uh, important characteristics that I've introduced to you. The first is the gene BCR3. And we think this is involved in the motility of cells. And I'm going to show you very briefly one slide just to explain how we're targeting that gene and trying to prevent metastatic breast cancer. And then Luke is going to in introduce TRAIL in a lot more detail. And TRAIL, we believe, um, has a very important role in killing stem cancer stem cells within tumors. So here's my opportunity to talk to, uh, science for one slide. Uh, this is a project uh, that has been going on in parallel to the work that Luke's been doing on BCL3. It's a rather um, complicated looking structure that I've put in, in front of you. But basics is that we've used very complex computer technology to draw cartoons, build models of how, what BCL3 looks like inside the cell of a tumor cell. And by doing that, we can start to model how BCL3 interacts with other factors within the cell. And by doing that, we think we've identified how they join together. And now we can model exactly what that interface is like between those two factors. And then we can start to design small chemicals, drugs as we call them, uh, to stop that interaction. It's effectively a way of just stopping BCL3 from working inside the cell. A three-year project uh, has been extremely successful. And what we've been able to do is identify a brand new compound that's not been described before. And this is from first principles of first identifying BCL3 as an important gene, uh, all the way through to actually chemically synthesizing this drug. And this uh, uh, image on the right-hand side is taken from uh, two mice, well, uh, and these are the lungs of two mice. On the left-hand side, this is a mouse that got, had very aggressive metastatic breast cancer. And the small white 
um, blobs in the uh, lung there are metastatic lesions within this mouse. On the right-hand side, this is a mouse that was given this new compound uh, from our laboratory, a, a mouse that would have got the same disease, and in fact, it's, uh, the amount of metastases in that uh, in those lungs are far reduced. And in fact, if we measure the, uh, the amount that we've blocked it, we think we can reduce, and this is the graph on the bottom, we think we can reduce metastases in this model by about 80%. And in more recent uh, work that we, I, I don't have slides for because it's absolutely brand new, we seem to actually have completely cured um, a, a cohort of a uh, small group of um, uh, uh, mice, completely cured them of the metastatic disease. It's very early stages at the moment, and we're now uh, looking to uh, push this forward to clinical trials in humans. Okay, so back to our star. Um, Luke's going to come up and talk to us now about the other approach that we have, which is targeting, uh, actually executing the cancer stem cells within the tumor. Uh, well, firstly, thank you to Richard and uh, Tenevis for uh, their very kind introductions today. Um, and uh, thank you for asking me to speak about some of my work, which hopefully I can relate to is uh, the work which I was doing under my PhD, which was all completely funded by Tenevis um, and supported for, by them throughout, um, throughout. So some of the people who you see donating, you donate your money to Tenevis, perhaps you can see a little, a little flash of what this goes towards in terms of the research that we get to do um, based on the funding that they give us. Um, the majority of the work I'm going to uh, talk about is uh, was published in this paper which you see here um, and may have seen a little bit of media attention as well. Um, and it revolves heavily around this cancer stem cell uh, concept um, which uh, Richard and uh, Alan have uh, generously already introduced for me. So I'm just going to skip straight to the point here and how we use these, um, how we potentially attack these um, dangerous cells. Um, so first thing which I'd like to introduce you to is uh, the, um, the idea that cancer cells, um, the difficulty in treating them is that basically they outgrow um, where their normal cells signaling where they would uh, where they'd be targeted for death. Um, so avoiding cell death is a real hallmark of cancer cells and as you can see by this cartoon here, um, when cell growth um, out massively outweighs uh, cell death on the um, on the on the seesaw here is when you get these uh, cancer, uh, cancer cells growing uncontrollably. So one way which we try to attack the cancer cells is by giving them an instructive cell death. Um, and there's the one way which, which we do that is you can introduce either, um, so I don't think it's showing particularly well on the screen. Oh, there it is. This little red blob, which was uh, my drug flashing in coming in. You give the drug to the cell. It uh, binds to a receptor on the surface of the cell. And it instructs the cell to die basically, and uh, that's one way of, of eliminating cancer cells. Um, and it's one way which current therapies already target um, cancer cells, um, so things like chemotherapy and radiotherapy target these cells to die in a similar sort of way. But unfortunately, they do it to all your normal cells, which is, again, is something which Mira has already introduced you to. So the idea is we really want to target just the cancer cells, and uh, you know, we could really reduce the side effects which we see um, currently, in the, um, currently in the clinic when people receive chemo and radiotherapy. So the first thing I'd like to introduce you to here is we, we focus primarily on breast cancer. This is what we call a panel of breast cancer cells. Um, there are four different lines which were taken from four different patients. And as Richard has already told you, uh, breast cancer is a very heterogeneous disease. And what that means is that there's lots of different subtypes of disease. Um, and not only is it heterogeneous as a disease, but each tumor is heterogeneous itself in the sense of there's a lot of different subtypes of cells within the different subtypes of disease. So it's a very complicated disease to try and treat. And the way that we try and do this the best is um, to try and represent them um, as a panel of different types of disease. And that's what these four cell lines are, are representing here is the four most common forms of breast cancer which we, which we present in the clinic. Um, so using um, our instructive cell death molecule, which is called TRAIL, Richard had already introduced you to it, um, it's a compound which has already been in production and already in use in clinical trials for various forms of cancer. And the wonderful thing about this uh, trail compound, which has been hailed as a wonder drug by many people, is that it specifically targets cancer cells with very, very limited off-target um, effects to normal cells. So it's exactly what we're looking for. You know, you want to target the cancer cells, you want to limit the, um, the, the side effects, and that's exactly what this drug does. Wonderful. Why aren't we giving it to everybody? Well, there's a problem. First of all, as you can see from this little graph here down on the left-hand side, my panel of breast cancer cells just doesn't respond to the drug in, 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 the, in the most part. And 
obviously that's a problem because it's no use giving people a drug which doesn't work for the most for the most part. So why might this be? And when we go to back to my instructive cell death diagram, it's not as simple as just giving something a, um, a signal on the surface and then that relays instantly to cell death. It's uh, unfortunate that when we give uh, breast cancer patients um, trail that it doesn't instantly um, give cell death because this uh, molecule which exists further down the signaling pathway called C-flip which effectively blocks the, the trail signal which would lead to the cell death normally. So what we did with that was we took our, again, our panel of cell lines which, uh, oh sorry, I should come back to this actually. This is one of the reasons why it's in um, clinical trials for things like lung cancer is because the levels of, these C of this um, molecule which would normally block it are not present really in these cells. And then that's why it's such a problem in breast is that this is expressed and it, it blocks, the, blocks the signal, or trail signal. Yeah. So when we come back to our breast, what we did was we came back to our breast panel and we thought, well, what if we remove this um, inhibitor of the, the trail signaling pathway? And what if we uh, genetically suppress it so that the molecule no longer exists in these cells, or at least at a very low level, will these cells then respond to our drug? And the, the short answer is using our panel of breast cancer cell lines again, uh, we could see that actually we managed to sensitize the entire panel to the, um, to the, to the drug. So, you know, we talk about personalized medicine. Another approach is, uh, you know, how do we expand? Um, well, another way of looking at therapy is try and find ones which basically everybody will respond to. Um, and that's another way of trying to attack it as well. Um, and you can see from these pictures a very clear depiction of um, what the cells would normally look like when they're treated with cancer, which is the, the image on your left. So you can see the cells are happily growing and pretty much untouched. And then we remove the, the C-flip molecule from these cells and treat them with trail again. And you can see all of these cells look particularly unhappy and basically they've all completely died off. So coming back to our treatments of cancer stem cell therapies, um, you know, it's all well and good treating uh, cancers with our drugs and sensitizing them to our drugs. But if, if they're not attacking the cancer stem cells, ultimately the, the point is the, the tumor will ultimately spread and uh, the tumor will relapse and regrow. Um, so it's important that, you know, when we're looking at new therapies that we come back to the cancer stem cells and we look specifically at that subset of cells and if we can attack those. Um, so the work that we did here is you can take our, again, our panel of cells <coughs> representing the different subtypes of breast cancer disease. And what we can do is we can take these cells and put them in specific culture conditions within the lab. And we can pretty much grow these small um, balls of tumors, which we call tumor spheres. I think Alan introduced them earlier. He's doing similar things with colorectal lines as well. So we're getting these small breast tumors which grow in these specific conditions within the lab. And when we introduced our treatment of TRAIL, which is um, we already know that the cells are pretty much uh, resistant to, we see it doesn't hit this, the third panel along. You can see it doesn't hit the set, these uh, cancer stem cells at all, because it's only the cancer stem cells which can form these tumor spheres and not, your, not any other of the, the subtypes of um, cells within the tumor. And it doesn't hit them at all, and neither does removing our C-flip molecule from, the, from them either. But when we combine the two of them together and we use that treatment and then look at the cancer stem cells, we can see that we don't get any of these spheres forming at all and um, effectively, a, 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 if anything, um, specifically targeting the cancer stem cells better than we are the general tumor. Um, so it, it comes back to that diagram which uh, Richard and Alan have both shown you where you need to directly specifically attack the cancer stem cells which should hopefully lead to longer term regression which gives the patient, <coughs> well, unfortunately long enough to basically die from other um, natural factors rather than from cancer and that's ultimately what a cure is. <coughs> so, a <laughs> bit morbid of me, I know, but <laughs> that's basically the results we're looking for. Um, so the important thing um, about cancer stem cells as well is not only do they initiate the disease and give rise to the tumors, but they're the, the subset of cells which are um, now being shown on numerous occasions to be responsible for the spread, so the metastasis of, of the disease. And as Richard has said, our, our, our lab is very focused on preventing this spread um, of disease as uh, we see it as basically the, the way of, uh, of prolonging life in patients as rather than attacking the primary tumor which can be relatively easily removed by surgical techniques. Um, and what this graph shows you is when we translated this work into mice and looked at the, um, looked at the spread of, of cancer which would normally metastasize to the lungs, if we gave these mice this treatment by removing C-flip and treating them with our drug trail, we saw very, very limited, I think actually we saw no side effects whatsoever of the treatment 
And um, what we did manage to do, though, was reduce the number of metastatic lung lesions by 98%. So that basically equated to, instead of, say, 100, um, which we probably would see about 100 normal met um, metastases in a lung, we then reduced that right the way down to just seeing two metastases in the lung, which was, uh, which was very good and positive to see because uh, if we can now translate this into humans, um, then we may have a treatment which um, may be effective and also cancer-specific where we, we see um, very limited offsides of target effects and with, uh, which we would normally see with chemo. So the question still remains is, can this translate into the clinic? And we still are in the process now of developing a drug which will inhibit CFLIP molecule um, in humans. And uh, the idea would then be to give the patients this drug in combination with TRAIL. And the important thing, of course, is to then look at what this may mean in terms of reducing patient metastasis and uh, you know, increasing um, lifetime in these patients as well. So. All that remains is for me to say a very big thank you to uh, ten of us for their three years' worth of funding. Um, they've been particularly good to me in terms of uh, allowing me because uh, I would say that the, the project didn't originally go, wasn't planned to go in this direction. Um, we made a, a, a slight detour and we found something which we believed would be important and um, a lot of funding bodies perhaps wouldn't allow you to go off on your own sort of side tangent but uh, we were very lucky in that Tenverse fully supported us and uh, understood the importance of this work and uh, helped support me uh, continue it on. And uh, I think we have a very good re working relationship with them and looking forward to working with uh, a new PhD student who's coming to work actually under my supervision and obviously Richard's, um, who starts next week. Um, so the, the relationship continues. So, thank you.